I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy, to the environment, to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. I'm your host, Scott Syfax. From the playgrounds of South Sacramento to his trip to the 1999 World Series with the San Diego Padres, Greg Vaughn has been to the show of Major League Baseball and has seen it all. He joins us to share his own Sacramento story. Greg, what was your greatest moment? The moment when you said, wow, this is really it. Well, I, I think for me it was, uh you know, the first time we came to play the Oakland A's mm -hmm. and, you know, having your grandmother and your cousins and your friends and your family, my kids, you know, and facing Dave Stewart, you know, growing up in Sacramento, some, you know, facing some of these guys that you grew, you grew up idolizing and then to be able to hit a home run off Dave Stewart and then to come back and win the game off uh, Dennis Eckersley, you know, that was pretty special, especially my first time in. Mm -hmm. What about the World Series? Oh, you know, of course that, uh -huh. you know. You know, we go way back, so I'm sure mm -hmm. you can, you know, remember, you know, any kid growing up, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, that's what we dreamed about is, uh, you know, making it to the World Series mm -hmm. and hitting a home run, you know, mm -hmm. hitting the home run of a World Series game. And for me, I just happened to hit two, mm -hmm. you know, in game one. But, you know, we, we didn't win, but, mm -hmm. you know, I accomplished half of it to be able to play in the World Series and to mm -hmm. be able to have my, my son there and, you know, like I said, my, my family and, and kids, it, it was special. Mm -hmm. Back in the 70s, when we were playing Pop Warner football, did you ever imagine that your career would take go this far? Yeah, believe it or not, that I, I'd see wow. myself. Mm -hmm. I see myself. Mm -hmm. You know, like once again, that that's what I dreamt about at mm -hmm. night. You know, see myself uh, on TV. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, watching the Bills with OJ or Walter Payton. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see myself actually mm -hmm. on TV. So. Is, you know, did I get lucky along the way? I'm sure. You know, mm -hmm. was I the most talented in Sacramento? Probably not, but I was in the right place at the right time. Right, right. And what do you think gave you the edge? You know, we, we grew up with a lot of really talented people. What do you think was that special combination of things that gave you the edge to go ahead and move forward the way that you did? Well, I think for me, I was pretty disciplined at an early age. You mm -hmm. know, I did, hitting baseballs or going to football practice, mm -hmm. or, that was never work. That was uh -huh. always fun for me, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Whereas you look at some of the other guys, it was, oh, you know, you thought you asked them to go out and cut five acres of pasture with a push mower right. or something, you know <laughs> what I mean? It, for me, it, it was never mm -hmm. that way. I think, you know, early on, like I said, you know, having a discipline to, uh, there was no place I'd rather be. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, having, you know, strong women in my life, whether it was my mother, you know, my grandmother, you know, they never told me what I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. They told me what I didn't want to hear. And, you know, it, it gave me a, a strong mental background at an early age to whenever someone said something or, or put doubt on me, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the influence of those strong women in your life. How, how, did, how did their presence impact you? Well, once again, you know, uh, as far as we, we couldn't be average, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was... Uh, if everyone else was here, you made sure you were up there, right. whether it was school, whether it was, you know, sports, whatever you did, mm -hmm. you know, that's, you wanted someone to, to leave that venue or your teachers to know to say, hey, he's not like everybody else. And when we slacked off because we are like every other kid, you know, they took stuff away. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I got to see it. I remember my mom said, well, you're not playing this Friday night. And I was like, what do you mean I'm not playing? <laughs> that was the deal. My deal mm -hmm. was to uphold my grades mm -hmm. and fortunately you know I talked to her in the progress report that I would get every week and mm -hmm. she allowed me to play but I knew she wasn't playing you know mm -hmm. they stood by their decisions and I knew the rules I knew the terms of the contract mm -hmm. going in and they wouldn't let us slip you know what I mean it's it's a situation now where you know me being a coach I see a lot of parents making excuses for the kids mm -hmm. I, the teacher was always right the, the adult was always right so I knew where I stood. The parents were, and the teachers were always on the same side back in the day. Correct. And, you know, we're, we're going to come back to that about just sort of your observations because you do coach today. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to stay with this, though. Other than 
those two incredible women in your life, who else was a strong influence on you in those early days? Well, you know, my mom's brother, my uncle mm -hmm. Henry, of course, my cousin Ricky Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, same Jets. I went to Kennedy. He went to Burbank. You know, he played in the NFL for 11 years. You know, I, I had strong male uh, surroundings, too. Mm -hmm. You know, male figures around me. Uh, you know, a, a stepfather who, who was there for us, too, Henry Andrews. Uh, so I, I had, for baseball-wise, you know, Paul, Paul Carmazzi. Mm -hmm. He was my Legion coach at 14. You know, he was the one that I thought at the time he didn't think I could play because he was always on me. Mm -hmm. You know, I never did it right. I never did this right. Mm -hmm. You know, constant, constantly on me. And he told me one time, he said, when I quit talking to you, that's when you should worry. Mm -hmm. And until this day, you know, when I would be up late, whether it was in Detroit, New York, Milwaukee, wherever, I could call him and he would always put things in perspective. You know, mm -hmm. so all these guys, all these people have became very close to me and they're still a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. Was it always baseball? Because, you know, you played multiple sports, and so at, at, when is it that baseball became the path? The path is, I think, uh, after my senior year in high school when everyone said I should quit baseball and play football because mm -hmm. that's what all my... Because that's what we remember you for as well. Well, everyone in Sacramento, mm -hmm. that's what they remember, you know, to mm -hmm. go to college to play football. Mm -hmm. But once again, I didn't like people telling me what I could and couldn't do, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I quit baseball, which everyone said... I mean, I quit football, which everyone thought mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. I was going to make it at, and I ended up playing uh, baseball, and then I was the fourth pick in the draft just because I didn't like people to tell me I couldn't do something. <laughs> and that sort of stick to itness, uh, I'm sure, has served you well over time as you've gone through things. One of the things that uh, uh, is always remarked about you is how you've kept in touch and that you still see people from your old neighborhood. You're a guy who comes back. Oh, yeah, there was no place I'd rather mm -hmm. be, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, this is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say, though, you know, getting traded to San Diego and living there on the water every day was it's pretty tempting. Not bad, right? Yeah, it was tempting. Waking up mm -hmm. to the ocean mm -hmm. every single day was, like I said, it was tempting, but this was home, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? How could I go back to South Sacramento and, and, and or Sacramento, period, and, and, and not make a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. Go back to John Sloat Elementary School. Mm -hmm. You know, John still... Uh, middle school at the time right. and you know tell these kids you can become something if I was never around so for me to come back was big and I like I said there's no place I'd rather be this is you know where my mother my sister my mm -hmm. my family is and family's the number one component of my life mm -hmm. as far as uh, you know priorities you know what I mean so it, there was no other place but here right let's go back to the 70s for a second 70s and early 80s uh, another player to come out of South Sacramento who had amazing promise was a guy named Ernest Lee. And several years ago, he took his life. But he came up around the same time as Kevin Johnson did, and all eyes were on him. What happens with young men sometimes who get caught up in the adulation of being identified as a, as a real prospect? Well, I, I think, you know, you know, peer pressure, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think with in Ernest's case, you know, him living around the corner from me, me knowing him pretty, pretty well, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing him in the off season and coming back and trying to help him, not to some extremes as other people, but help him get on track. You know, it, I, I think, you know, during the time and not to take anything away from KJ, and I think if you ask KJ, he would say, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't hold this guy. You know, Ernest mm -hmm. was the Baron Davis before there was a Baron Davis, the big body guard that you couldn't stop, sure. you know, led the nation in scoring in college and, you know, but priorities, you know, mm -hmm. you know sometimes, you know, there's that fine line and some of us get on the fence and mm -hmm. don't know which way to go. And I think that's what happened to Ernest. And I think when he was mature enough to uh, finally realize what happened, that we all have a window mm -hmm. and that his window was, Closing mm -hmm. or closed, mm -hmm. you know, after a couple of uh, NBA camps, mm -hmm. it, it was tough to deal with, you know, and, and that's what I try to tell all, a, a lot of young people, you know, that, uh, you know, I think sometimes from the inner city is, quote unquote, I don't think we really have one, but South Sacramento would be that. I think we, we base too much of our life, our expectations on sports. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of ways to be successful. There's a lot of ways to to make a difference and influence, I mean, in, in other people's lives. And I think in the inner city, we base on what we see on TV. 
-hmm. you know, and I, I think we need we need to get back to education being the, the first and the foremost mm -hmm. of uh, what we need to take care of. What do you think is um, is an athlete's responsibility from from a pro level in terms of, of setting an example? You know, Charles Barkley had that famous line, I am not a role model. But, you know, as you say, a lot of these kids, particularly, you know, these inner city kids, but all kids, they look up to athletes. How is it that you think that that balance is struck? What's the responsibility? Tough question, you know, and, you know, Charles, which who is a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. you know, when my son was young, he would come to my season tickets during the game or in mm -hmm. timeouts and say hello, you know. So I think, you know, Charles just made a comment at a particular time when, you know, anything can come out of his mouth. I, I think for us... It we, still we, does, actually. Yeah, yeah. And it's, <laughs> I love it. I mean, but, but the thing about it is he tells the truth, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I think we do hold some sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to, to young people, mm -hmm. but I think what makes us intriguing is everything's based on money, cars, things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they're just things. Mm -hmm. it, but that's what they can relate to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And some, like I said, for me, it was never... Walter Payton was my guy growing up. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, everything about him I idolized, but my role models were my mother, my grandmother, you know, my stepfather. Mm -hmm. Those people that played a big influence in my daily life were my role models. They were your real heroes. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Without mm -hmm. a doubt, they, they were. The ones that got up and went to work, you know, a hard day's mm -hmm. work for a hard day's pay, you mm -hmm. know. So it, I, I think we have to get back to that. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, how do you bring some of those experiences to the coaching that you now do with young people? How how does you know that experience inform what you do with kids today? Well, like I said, I, I'm all for old school. You know mm -hmm. what I mean. I, I'm not now now share share with the audience a little bit what you mean by you're all for old school. Well, like you said, seventies. That sounds so far away now. Yeah, you know it that? does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was no such thing as a timeout, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? If I got a timeout just because I did something wrong, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I'd be sitting in this chair right now, you know? <laughs> just go sit in the corner for 20 minutes and yeah. it's all good after that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think we have to get back to the, to, to the point of respect. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, a sense of respect as far as young people have towards older people or mm -hmm. young people, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And like I said, on a daily basis, I don't think parents hold kids accountable now. And like, you know, we were talking, if a teacher or an adult said something, there wasn't uh, but uh, you know that it was, was it. it. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. in the story. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and nowadays, all kids have an opinion, mm -hmm. and I disagree. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have an opinion, but if you're not paying, like I tell my kids, I haven't seen you guys pay one bill <laughs> <laughs> or grocery bill uh -huh. in this house, and. So my, my opinion is going to be the, the last one that matters. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, there's, you can there's go take the door. Yeah, just mm -hmm. like my mom told me, there's mm -hmm. the door. If you don't want to abide by my rules and you don't want to respect what's going on in this household, mm -hmm. there's the door. So when I say mm -hmm. old school, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Nowadays, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not for that. Mm -hmm. So what, what headache, uh, what's the most common headache as a coach you face? Or you say, you look at parents and you're messing up, you're doing it wrong because of the fact that this pervasiveness is sort of like this uh, self-esteem generation where everybody's empowered to have an equal voice. Children have an equal voice with parents. What, what's the most common mistake you see with uh, the parenting that you see these kids come through with from, from your coaching? Well, I think it's a couple different areas. You know, for one, you know, where everyone has a, you know, in baseball, I'll just take baseball for example. Kids at a young, younger age are getting specialized. They're dealing with one sport. Mm -hmm. Parents are buy, getting them hitting instructors, pitching instructors at 8, 9, 10. And I think it's hurting them because now what I've seen, whether it's coaching summer league, minor league baseball, or dealing with some of the pro teams that I deal with, a lot of the young kids think it's one-word answers that can fix you. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and we're forgetting what sports are all, all about are competing. Mm -hmm. If you watch any game now, you listen to the announcer, especially the ones that have played, oh, he's a great competitor. You know, he's, he competes like no other. Mm -hmm. You know, 
we're doing all this stuff, but we're forgetting to teach them how to compete. You know, and, and the bottom line is if we worry about mechanics, I don't about, know about you because I'm an avid golfer now. Uh -huh. If I'm worrying about my golf swing, the ball, I have no chance. Mm -hmm. You know, but if I just go out there and just play against the golf course, mm -hmm. I have a tendency to play a little bit better. You know, right. so I, I think parents are getting these kids just putting too much pressure on them, getting them to specialize in one sport at an early age. And Almost two, like they're sucking the joy out of it. In a way. Oh, yeah, they're making it way mm. too serious. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? If, I mean, like I told my son, you know, if dad's going to love you unconditionally no matter what mm -hmm. if you didn't play baseball. He just happens to play for the Mets. If, if you didn't, I'm still going to be just as proud of you. Mm -hmm. But some of these parents are putting all the pressure on these kids. And I see it firsthand, you know, where we, we don't play that. Oh, it's okay. You didn't get a good grades. You know, our thing is if you get detention or you are slacking in class, you will not play. Mm -hmm. And the parents are like, I can't believe you're not going to let them play. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm like, you can't believe. So this game is more important than his education. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think, you know, there's a couple different areas where parents are putting way too much pressure on these kids and also not keeping it in perspective because I – I don't know where I'd be if my son ever thought grades weren't important. I know mm -hmm. he wouldn't be on the Mets, mm -hmm. and I probably wouldn't be sitting here. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. it, the, they probably would have had to come get me because he has one job, and that's education. Right. Let, let's talk about your son for a second. So he's on his own journey now in baseball. Uh, how's he holding up? He's holding up good. I mean, mm -hmm. he is, he's a big, strong kid. Mm -hmm. But, too, you know, we, we fight the same adversity that all you know that every other father and son you know he takes the things that I'm trying to give him to mm -hmm. help him pass up people as you know sometimes the difficulties of dad it's not good enough it's not hard enough mm -hmm. so you know you, you have to walk that fine line and for me I wait I try to wait till he comes to me you know mm -hmm. what I mean so I don't put too much pressure on him like I said it's tough mm -hmm. you know it's the only job in the whole world based on failure in the whole world <laughs> 70% mm -hmm. of the time, if you fail, you're considered great, mm -hmm. you know, and for a lot of people, it's tough to deal with. Right. You know, it's interesting about that because it's true. It's, it's easier for a father to give somebody else's son advice and for it to be received than to sometimes give their own. Oh, no doubt. I, 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 can live, I agree 100%, uh -huh. you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so let's, let's talk about kids in general in this region, you know, but across the country. You know, when we were coming up, baseball was the national pastime. I mean, football and baseball kind of competed, you know, neck and neck with each other, but baseball was the sport. And today, you know, I, I talk to kids just like you do, and for a certain set of kids, baseball is still the sport, but for a, a growing number of kids, it seems like baseball is kind of a sport that's fading into the background. Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I think... You know, this has been a hot topic among Major League Baseball and, you know, a lot of former players mm -hmm. of, you know, African-American players. That yeah, particularly in the African-American community. The, mm -hmm. our, our kids aren't playing because, once again, we're enthralled with that hip-hop. You know, as mm -hmm. young African-American kids, you know, you see LeBron and Carmelo, and mm -hmm. they're on the cover of every hip-hop magazine. They're, they're doing all the commercials. They're in the videos with the rappers, mm -hmm. and we have a tendency to – put them on a pedestal, and so they're, they want to be like them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now you don't even see baseball guys, in, you know, in, anymore. I mean, you, don't, you find a few, what, Joe Maurer and a couple other that, mm -hmm. that, that are on TV outside of playing a game. So I think that's one reason. And another, number two, I, I think the expense. I think, you know, when we were coming up, it was, what, $15, $20 a kid? Yeah, I mean, it's cheap. Now it's two fifty. Right. And if you're coming from, at the time, South Sacramento in a single-parent home and you have three kids. Much two, easier to buy a basketball In 15 than, than minutes gear. to go get yeah. them, you, you know. And, and two, the, the game is slow for them. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a lot of kids want instant gratification. And when I get out there, in baseball, like I said, round ball, round bat, it's tough. Mm -hmm. So you have to put in hours and you have to put in work. You know, sometimes they say, hey, it's much easier for me to go to this playground and shoot the ball through a hoop, and, you mm -hmm. know, it's much faster for them. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, is that, you know, a, a, a weird phenomenon, Greg, is that it seems like sometimes kids are more interested in playing sports on TV uh, via video games than they are in actually getting outside in real life. I mean, is that a part of it, too? 
Oh, without a doubt. I, I think the video game era, and, and like I said, there's been many nights in hotel rooms where I would play, or I would come home and play with my son. I, I, I think we have to keep that in perspective also because I think the video game era is hurting us because, once again, our kids don't know how to compete mm -hmm. because they never lose. On a video game. On a video game. Mm -hmm. If they're losing, whereas we would try to come back, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it didn't matter what the score was, we felt we could win. Mm -hmm. They'll hit reset or they'll turn it off, so they never lose, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. another thing, too, is, you know, the highlights, you know, all the whatever, whether it's Fox, ESPN, I love those shows because they can keep you informed, but our kids say, why would I watch a whole game and learn how to play when mm -hmm. I can just see the highlight, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So that... They, they really don't have any passion to get out there. Like I said, once again, it's, it's tough for a kid to want to be outside when mm -hmm. I can, and I might have to sweat, it might mm -hmm. be hot, and mm -hmm. when I can go just sit in my room and I can text, mm -hmm. get on my computer and play a video game. Mm -hmm. But then you have some that do love being outside and those mm -hmm. are the ones that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question because you know, you talk a lot about sports and how it impacted you, but the, the lessons that the people important to you brought to the table that helped make you who you are. You know, in terms of the massive success that you've achieved, what are the couple key, two or three keys of success that you think that, you know, are worth sharing that, that are replicatable, regardless of what you do? Well, well, I, th I think first and foremost is, you know, I think what sports gave me was the concept of team, mm -hmm. you know, not I. And when you look at life, I mean, you have to be able to deal with all types of people in all walks mm -hmm. and all different situ situations. And sports was a big key for that. But I think first and foremost was my grandmother and my mother not allowing me to satisfy for being average. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I didn't want to be average. So whatever my endeavors are, I'm going to go out there to try to be better than the next person. Right. I don't care what it is. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to try to set the set the bar kind of high so and, and go for it mm -hmm. i think being competitive like and it doesn't all walks of life whatever mm -hmm. i'm doing mm -hmm. i'm trying to beat the next man or be the best at it and mm -hmm. i think i learned that at an early age once again from my grand my grandmother five all five foot three or four of her she was the toughest i remember mm -hmm. one story we went down to the 49er game we were watching my cousin ricky at the time jerry rice was the man right and ricky's one of the top corners and Ricky just covered Jerry. I think he got one pass that game. He had that big streak where he was catching a lot of passes, mm -hmm. and it happened to be for a touchdown. And Ricky comes outside and says, hey, Grandma, Grandma, how are you? Mm -hmm. And she says, boy, you better start hitting somebody. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it was. Yeah. I see her after the game in Oakland or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, two for two, two mm -hmm. for three, driving mm -hmm. three. Oh, you better get in that cage and get some BP. You know, she never <laughs> let us be satisfied. Right. But kids nowadays. Even at a pro level. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, because, like I tell my son, once you get to that level, now mm -hmm. you have the whole world trying to take your job. Right, right. And the whole world sort of watching and criticizing. One thing uh, that uh, I was fascinated to learn about you is that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff on the internet. And anybody who's a public figure li like yourself has, you know, lots of supporters and lots of critics as well. But you don't pay attention to any of that stuff. It's wasted energy, as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. Once again, uh, grandmother and mother and, and, mm -hmm. and my mother, why worry about things you have control over or things you don't have control over? Mm -hmm. Why am I going to worry? Everyone has entitled to their opinion. Mm -hmm. But now it starts becoming a distraction if I let that opinion affect my life. Mm -hmm. You know, and I learned that why should I worry about the guy on the top row, the, the bleachers, you know, section 500 up mm -hmm. there. Why should I care about what he says about me? He might have had a bad day at work. Right. He could be going through tough times. It doesn't matter. Everyone's entitled to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just try not to base my life on mm -hmm. other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Sacramento. You know, this town, uh, truth be told, is really a baseball crazy town. And uh, we've had a lot of talent that's come out of here. There's been so much focus as of late on the Kings, the arena, and the Rivercats are successful. Why is there never any talk about bringing a Major League Baseball team to Sacramento? I don't know. I think that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, without a doubt, I think this this city is for for as small as it is, mm -hmm. being all over the country. If you said Sacramento, oh, Sac City, Sacramento, mm -hmm. there's so many players that have came here from, you know, they, I think they compared it to Tampa. You know, when mm -hmm. you know Sheffields and G Dwight Goodens and those mm -hmm. guys, as far as being that small and producing type of players that we have, I think that 
hopefully we can stay hot. Right, right. now, you know, you know, with getting the Kings Arena, mm -hmm. and then hopefully not not too far down the line we can uh, add a baseball, whether it's the Oakland A's to that. Sounds good. Well, listen, we're in our final moments right now, and you know, based on what you said, and and what you're doing, and but but really your message, you know, I could see, you know, much like uh, our our friend KJ, uh, a life beyond uh, just sort of running an equestrian center and doing good deeds coaching for you in the future. You ever thought about politics or anything like that? No, no, politics, I mean, that's cutthroat. A little too, the, the, that fear, I, mean, I don't know how good of a competitor I am <laughs> for that, you know. And the Equestrian Center, that's my wife, she runs that. Okay. She okay. runs that. Okay, so in our last 10 seconds, what's next for Greg Vaughn? Like I said, is just teaching, trying to make a difference mm -hmm. and uh, being a positive influence on young people. Mm -hmm. Greg, thank you so much for coming to Studio Sacramento and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. We're proud of you, and we, we know great things are coming in the future. Thank you. Well, that's our show. And thanks to Greg Vaughn, and thanks to you for watching. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.